All this in Jan's one Russo GV accent. This is the history of paper money, not just noodles. Extra history part two where the channel extra credits. How does paper money get introduced? Who has to lose their head to do so? And what does Marco Polo have to do with anything? What? Marco Polo? Marco Polo has something to do with this? Come on. So yeah. <clears throat> paper money. This is a great concept. You know, uh, I didn't see any video before this channel that talks about paper money like this. But yeah, a good history video that tracks the history of time where paper money became the more regular and the way we know today. So it's gonna be fun. Remember, if you like my reaction, don't forget to like and subscribe. Check out the reaction date. There's a link in the description. Check out the casual plays like history, old Sakash Proxon, Internet Story, and Kazuya Nutshell, uh, CGP Grey. And yeah, let's watch this one. While there's little truth to the idea that Marco Polo brought pasta to Italy from the East, there's another marvel that the book about his travels popularized. It was an idea, a radical one, which is perhaps best summarized by the very title of the chapter that discusses it. For in the Book of the Marvels of the World, or as we know it, the Travels of Marco Polo, there's a chapter titled, How the Great Khan Caused the Bark of Trees, Made into Something Like Paper, to Pass for Money Throughout His Realm. What? Kublai Khan started that? What are you talking about? Really? Kublai started that? In ancient China, they invented a coinage system, where the coins had holes punched in them. So if you needed to measure out large denominations, you could just run a string through the center of the coins, and a particular length of string would hold a hundred or a thousand at once. But over time, the economy evolved, transactions got bigger, and merchants found themselves needing tens or hundreds of thousands of coins to complete transactions. And, of course, a strand of a thousand of these weighed about ten pounds already, so it became a real pain in the neck to transport them. So the government started saying, How about we pay you pieces of paper that have the amount of coins we owe you written on them, and you can come pick up your coins at the capital whenever you want your money. And since the government bought a lot of things, these paper slips started being circulated everywhere. Soon, merchants realized that these slips of paper were always good, that they could be turned in at the capital for however much was written on them whenever they wanted. So heck, why even go to the trouble of turning them in? Why not just trade the slips of paper to other merchants for their goods? Thus, the merchants began using these promissory notes, or essentially government IOUs, as money. And then the government caught on and simply started printing up money. So by the time we got the travels of Marco Polo, paper money was Oh, so it didn't start with the Kublai Khan. It's from the Tang Dynasty, 7th century. It was widespread, and this idea started to catch on even outside of China. Sometimes with little success. Like when Gekatu, the corrupt Ikan of the Middle East, tried to introduce paper money after he'd already splurged the royal money, and had his economy collapse to a cow plague. He basically fell prey to the misconception that simply printing money was literally a way to print money. Needless <laughs> to say, he was promptly strangled with a bowstring. But sometimes, in other places, the idea started to take stronger hold, especially Italy. The Italian city-states had already been playing with this idea a little. They were the economic dynamos of Europe, and the first truly great trading cities on the continent since the ancient world. They were also basically always at war. Yeah. This made carrying around great heaping piles of cash a wee bit of a danger. So the merchants came up with a new system, influenced by the tales from China. At first, they began simply issuing promissory notes, basically IOUs. Merchants would get to a new town and stock up on supplies and trade goods, but rather than carrying the cash to pay for them across dangerous country, they would just give the seller an IOU, often backed by a very famous or wealthy merchant, promising to pay for the goods at a later date. But here's the- See, that's the thing. That's what the, basically, paper money is, approved by Gregorio. In our time, we have symbol of our country, our government, basically. So backed by our country. That is how money has, you know, value, basically. Uh, government or some powerful entity, empire or something, you know, says it has a value. Like, you know, this is, uh, I guess, $10. U.S. government backs it up because, you know, we can give you $10 worth of gold as well if you want it. This has uh, value because we say it's value. So, you know, in that sense, money has value because, you know, in that area, in that government, basically it has value. ...by a very famous or wealthy merchant, promising to pay for the goods at a later date. But here's the trick. To keep anybody from having to haul all that money around, the merchant wouldn't ever actually end up paying the seller directly. Instead, he would just pay a bank in his hometown. Here's how it would work. The merchant selling the goods would take the promissory note he got for them to his local bank, which he had access to, unlike most of Europe, because the Crusades had accidentally created modern banking. Why let a little crusade get in the way of a good story about fiscal instruments? 
So he would take the note down to the bank and cash it in for slightly less than its face value. Basically, the bank was buying the note from him for some amount less than it was worth. Then the bank, which would have branches in other cities, would send a rider with a stack of these notes out to whatever specific city those notes had originally come from. When the rider got to the city, he would hand them to the local branch of the bank, and then the local branch would go collect from the merchant who had bought the goods. So the merchant could pay for goods in a far-off location by paying his local bank after the fact. And that's why kids, banks are crucial. Everybody panics when a bank collapse. That banks cannot fall because of this, otherwise global economy would fall. A pretty huge step forward for commerce. But what if the bank didn't have a branch in the merchant's hometown? Well, then the bank would just sell the promissory note to another bank that did have one there. So these promissory notes sort of started to take on a value of their own. People started trading these notes, and soon the banks got in on the action and just let you take out notes from the bank itself if you had the deposits to cover it. But this didn't reach its full form for quite some time. Fast forward about 300 years and move halfway across the continent to the little island hanging off of Italy's side. The year is 1640. The never popular Charles I's monarchy is deeply in debt. He had gotten into a tiff with the parliament and basically disbanded it for over a decade. But according to English law, parliament is the only group allowed to levy taxes, which you do need when you're a king and flat broke. But not Charles. No, no, no. He had all sorts of crazy- Yeah, but he can shut off the parliament because I'm a king. Can't he just change the law because he's a king, right? He schemes for bringing in money without calling on parliament. So miffed he was at them. And in 1640, we have one fine example. He just seized all the money in the mint. And this is kind of a big deal because it wasn't his money in the mint. All the merchants and the goldsmiths of London deposited their hard currency at the mint Damn. just as a place to store it. So the king just picked up all that cash and declared it to be another one of his ever-popular forced loans. And then he proceeded to also seize all of the East India Company's pepper, just to add a strange, if somewhat delectable, twist to this tale. Needless to say, his head was promptly yeah. separated from his body. Which leaves us in- Yeah, it's not because he took the, all the money from the mint. No, no, no. It's because he took the pepper from East India Company. That shit cannot pass. <laughs> the aftermath with a bunch of merchants and goldsmiths. The merchants and goldsmiths got together, and the goldsmiths basically said, look, we have these giant vaults for storing all of our gold. If you want to pay us a small amount, you can rent a corner of the vault to put all of your money in. This rapidly evolved to the goldsmiths paying people small amounts of interest to leave their money with them in exchange for the right to lend it out. That's this a bank. basically made them into banks. And in their capacity as banks, when people would deposit their money, the goldsmiths would basically give the depositor a receipt, which they could turn back in to claim their money. But soon, these goldsmiths made a pivotal switch. They changed from making out receipts, which could only be redeemed by the person who originally made the deposit, to also offering receipts that could be redeemed by whomever held them. This allowed people to start using their receipts as currency. Rather than pay for something with a pile of coins, why not just put that pile of coins in the bank and pay for stuff with these far more convenient receipts? Of course, as soon as they started doing this, people began to ask for multiple receipts in small, regular denominations. So you'd go to the bank, you'd drop off 20 quid, and ask the nice fellow at the register to- That is what the money is, right, today? The, it's powered by the Reserve Bank of your country, Federal Bank, Reserve Bank, whatever give you 20 receipts for one pound apiece so that you could go out and buy some vegetables or something with them. As soon as you do that, you basically have the banknote, the fundamental form of paper money. And the goldsmiths were clever folk. They started to notice the funny thing about banknotes. These banknotes were starting to get passed around from hand to hand without often getting handed back in at the bank, which meant that the bankers could keep playing around with the money those notes were supposed to represent even as they circulated through the markets. After all, so long as everybody doesn't try to turn in their banknotes at once, the bank can lend more money than it actually has in its vaults. While one banknote is circulating its way from hand to hand, the bank can use the coins that note represents to cover somebody else turning their banknote in. And thus, fractional reserve banking was born, instantly yeah. expanding the money supply of England. But not without introducing some dangers. Join us next time as we move from these Wild West beginnings to the even wilder West personas that attempted to make paper money official. Yeah, this is what happened, uh, I guess, in tw 2008. The banks started to give all loan and money that they didn't have, and all just went to shit. 
So yeah, that is how the money basically works, right? I mean, in uh, you know, it's it, you don't have to deposit gold in certain bank like Reserve Bank or something just to have power to the money. No, nowadays it's usually how much a country is worth, how much trading goods a country is worth. In that base, that particular money has worth, I guess, like how you know dollar is worth certain, I guess, rupee or something like that. Every uh, country's money and currency has some worth based on that i guess but yeah this is obviously start in britain like most things so yeah but you know original money started i guess in tang dynasty in seventh century in china damn that's something all right people that was a history of paper money not just noodles but the channel extra credits if you like my reaction don't forget to like subscribe check out the reaction there's a link in the description check out the castle place check out the end cards and i'll see you next time